All right. Welcome, everybody, to Cardiovascular Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, first, uh, some housekeeping notes. Um, there won't be Cardiovascular Medicine Grand Rounds the next two weeks. We'll be resuming on February 29th, um, just so you're all aware. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Geoffrey Williams. He's a clinical professor of medicine at University of Michigan, and we had the luck uh, for him joining our um, faculty just uh, only a few months ago. So we're very um, excited and, and, and lucky to, to have him here. He's also a professor emeritus of medicine and center of community health and prevention at University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. And he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Southeast Norway. After receiving, after retiring from University of Rochester, he, ser he served as the medical director for the Collaborative Science and Innovation Unit at the Billings Clinic in Billings, Montana. Dr. Williams is an internist with board certification in lipids and hypertension. He'd received his medical degree from Wayne State University School of Medicine. He performed his fellowship in biopsychological medicine and general internal medicine prior to receiving his PhD in health psychology from University of Rochester. Dr. Williams has over 35 years of practice experience in academic internal medicine and training as a health psychologist. He has contributed to the development of self-determination theory model or SDT for health behavior change, focusing much of his research career on SDT and its application intervention for health-related motivation, tobacco dependence treatment, diabetes self-management, adherence to medications, and other health behaviors that are difficult to change. Today, he will be talking to us about to tobacco dependence treatment and motivation. Okay, help me welcome him. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very nice, kind intervention, uh, introduction, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm. It's really an honor and a privilege uh, and a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Detroit area and spent uh, almost all of my career there in Rochester, New York. And when I had the opportunity to come back here, I, I knew that I wanted to be back and had the opportunity to talk with uh, Dr. Bisignano and uh, found a, uh, a place that I could uh, contribute here. So looking forward to telling you about a lot of things that I've been working on um, and with tobacco dependence treatment um, and uh, how we fit motivation into our clinical work. My disclosures, uh, as mentioned, adjunct professor, University of Southeastern Norway. I work on uh, uh, pay, uh, with uh, the dental group, with patients with dental anxiety, and uh, on actually studies on flossing and brushing, believe it or not, and uh, on a behavioral nudges uh, R18 uh, at Northwestern uh, for uh, diabetes prevention. In full disclosure, I also have three children. Um, they're grown and away. I like to build wood boats, and I'm also a Mark Twain scholar, which means a couple of my publications have focused on Mark Twain and motivation. Uh, so what I'd like to cover today with you is uh, and leave you with an understanding of guidelines for effective tobacco dependence treatment. There is a great deal of evidence that we have. Uh, Utilize the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and now American Heart Association's endorsed 5A's brief counseling model to motivate long-term abstinence, improve cardiovascular health, and to reduce perioperative complications, which is a program that we're going to initiate here. Um, you can understand how supporting autonomy and competence for treatment enhances motivation and behavior change, and appropriately recommend pharmacologic treatments for tobacco dependence. So as a, as a broad overview, uh, this statement from Nancy Rigotti's article on uh, tobacco dependence treatment on uh, JAMA 22, it's an excellent article if you wish to read that, covers, I think, some of the really key points to understand. Um, and first is that cigarette smoking is a chronic relapsing disorder. Whatever model you build to treat it, it's not going to be just about helping someone quit once, but 
the system has to be ready to accept people back because on average, people need more, uh, six or more times to be successful in quitting. Now, some people are successful right away, but many, most people will come back and we need to be able to treat them in a positive and motivating way. 90% of smokers begin in adolescence between the ages of 12 and 17. And we have 34 million uh, adult smokers in the United States uh, currently. It is associated with physical dependence uh, on nicotine, which means they have tolerance and uh, withdrawal syndrome. And it is a learned behavior. This fits in, it becomes a habit ingrained into their life. And I think the the really basic message, one of the basic messages to get across is that in order for people to successfully leave tobacco out of their life, we have to address mm -hmm. both their physical dependence and their habits. Uh, there are probably additional levels at the social level uh, that are going to be important as well, but this is where uh, individual treatment uh, starts. So this is some of the aggregated data we have. Uh, uh, I'm going to review these. Most of these are uh, done in uh, meta-analyses, uh, looking across different modalities of treatment. So group counseling works uh, uh, to increase quit rates over self-help. Uh, individual counseling also uh, increases uh, quit rates. And we're analyzing 27 studies there. And embedded within that, it's, uh, there's a very clear dose response relationship. Um, if you simply give a brief advice, someone should stop smoking, patients get a 30 to 50% increase in quit rate uh, once you get out to about six months. If you provide five to 10 minutes of brief counseling using the five A's model that I'm going to describe, um, you get, and, in, and, in, and include medications with that, you can double that quit rate. But if they come for four to eight visits, total of 90 to 300 minutes of contact time, you can quadruple that uh, quit rate over them trying themselves. Now, over 55% of smokers in 2018 tried to quit, but only about 7% of those that tried were successful. And we can improve that by designing a system that supports people's needs and provides treatment. Have you focus here on the lower tier within this table? Um, so uh, to get to uh, Dr. Rigotti's point, if we add behavioral therapy as an adjunct to pharmacotherapy, we can still see significant increase in, in long-term cessation. And looking at it the other way, if you combine behavioral therapy uh, and add uh, pharmacotherapy um, versus brief advice or usual care, we can see an almost doubling of uh, the long-term quit rate uh, across this group of studies. Um, and uh, the confidence level in that is, is high because of the number of studies, number of participants, and the way that this has been tested in multiple centers. Um, efficacy and effectiveness for any of the nicotine replacement products, uh, varenicline and bupropion, are listed here in this table. You'll see that we have many trials that this has been assessed in across nicotine products, about a 50% increase in success rate. And again, this is at six months uh, from uh, the initiation of treatment. <clears throat> um, it's broken down um, by patch, lozenge, gum, inhaler, and nasal spray. I actually haven't used the mouth spray, but it exists. Um, and uh, generally, you see about uh, one and a half times increase in quit rate uh, with use of these medications. Varenicline, uh, marketed as Chantix, uh, has had 27 studies, uh, very consistent findings. Uh, you more than double quit rate. And in one large, important uh, eff effectiveness study um, uh, called the EAGLE study, it was demonstrated, this is about 8,000 patients, it's been demonstrated to uh, be superior to bupropion uh, or the nicotine patch. Um, and it it is it does so because it has two mechanisms of action, which I'll, I'll tell you about in, in uh, a little bit of time. We've also learned that we can combine short and long-term nicotine replacements. In other words, if you give someone a patch, that gives them a, a baseline level of nicotine, 
that is preventing withdrawal, but then the short term, either gum, lozenge, nasal spray can be added as the person's going into a situation that's stressful where they think they might relapse, or if they start to get strong urges and they can add those and we can increase uh, quit rates with that. We can also combine uh, bupropion with nicotine replacement in a similar way. And even varenicline with nicotine replacement uh, has been started to be studied. The five A's model that I uh, want to introduce and focus on, and I, it is, uh, this can be used and has been demonstrated to be effective across all health behavior change um, uh, counseling that we do. It doesn't matter whether it's nutrition change, physical activity, alcohol reduction, tobacco dependence, wearing sunscreen, using seat belts, uh, a variety of uh, different behaviors uh, have, respond to uh, it, it, structuring your intervention uh, for a five to 10 minute intervention with one follow-up. So this is always designed for, for brief counseling to have at least one follow-up visit. So within tobacco, and this is where the initial evidence came from in the late 1980s from the National Cancer Institute, is to assess tobacco use, addiction level, understand what the patient feels the relative re relevant risks are and what benefits they may get to stopping. Because oftentimes they misunderstand what those are and you want an opportunity to understand them so you can acknowledge them. Person is gonna be more motivated to quit around their own reasons but it shouldn't stop us from also providing advice. And that is to be as direct as possible um, that, they, that their health would improve, their quality of life would improve if they're able to quit smoking and to quit smoking as soon as they're able to would be the okay. advice. You also need to respect the patient's autonomy here. Uh, you wanna ask them if they're willing to quit after you give your advice statement. And so, um, uh, here you're going to ask if they are willing to set a quit date and quit smoking. Ideally, that would be within two weeks, but if not, four weeks can work. And we've had studies that go out for uh, continuing pharmacotherapy going out all the way to three months with people cutting cigarettes in half each month and then quitting in that third month that have been very successful in producing long-term quit. So we have a variety of patterns that you can use. If they're willing to work with you, that's great. They just want a couple of visits, you can schedule that. If you wanna make your own intervention into a more intensive intervention, you'd simply use the four A's with, with four separate visits or five or six visits, depending on what they need to reassess how things are going. If they are willing to go for intensive treatment, you wanna refer them there because of that additional benefit. And that's clearly identified by the US Preventive Services Task Force uh, in their recommendations for trying to work with patients. You'll assist them uh, in a quit, a quit attempt. Uh, this involves teaching them about nicotine withdrawal, about how to change behaviors and habits, and the appropriate prescription of medications. The final A is to arrange for follow-up. Um, and um, uh, this is a very busy slide, but it's uh, from uh, scientific uh, advisory from the American Heart Association, late 2021, around uh, the American Heart Association endorsing the 5A's model for health behavior change. And uh, it also ties this to the theory of motivation that I've been working in um, since the time of my PhD and uh, relates that to uh, the shared decision-making process. Uh, I'll go over some of that more in detail but if you would like to see a synthesis of, of this uh, and evidence behind it, it's an excellent article to see at it's in circulation, December of 2021. To put smoking in perspective, um, as I mentioned, we have 34 million adult smokers. We have 480,000 people who die in America each year from tobacco-related illness. This has been consistent for 50 years. And even though the percentage of smokers has gone down, we have an increasing population. And the tobacco industry has been successful in recruiting uh, smokers to replace those that have died early. Um, it also causes 50,000 deaths from secondhand smoke. Uh, the majority of those, vast majority, 40 to 45,000 of those deaths would be secondary to 
to cardiovascular disease. And that has to do with uh, the cardiovascular effects of very small amounts of smoke with dramatic increase in platelet uh, uh, ad adhesiveness, um, increase in uh, endothelial dysfunction, um, indicate that, uh, first of all, people at risk are more likely to have heart attacks and strokes, uh, but also that they really don't get a benefit, and uh, a cardiovascular benefit, unless they quit completely. Whereas with some other diseases, there is more of a dose response to improvement. But here, when you counsel your patients about quitting, you want to be sure that you advise them to quit completely and recognize that probably a third of them, even after a heart attack, and the same is true after a cancer diagnosis, will return to smoking and think that they're able to do that at a low level of four or five, six cigarettes. Um, but you want to be sure that you check for that and uh, make sure that they understand if they want the benefit, they need to quit completely. Now, the secondhand smoke uh, uh, data is, is quite interesting. There have now been 16 large geographical areas that have banned secondhand smoke just in public places. So people are still exposed at home and in cars and so forth, but in public places. And in each of those areas, like Toronto is uh, one good example, was studied in detail, New York State, um, Rome, Scotland, um, in each of them, uh, within a month of the time of banning that, there's been a 40% reduction of heart attacks presenting at uh, hospitals in the, in the area. Uh, in one place, Helena, Montana, that was rescinded uh, by pressure from the tobacco industry and af after six months. And again, within a month, that rate of heart attack increased uh, to where it was before. So there's a profound effect of even small amounts of smoke and cardiovascular risk. About 14% of American adult Americans smoke. It was lower than that. Um, but when we got to COVID, I think because of the stress people felt with that and perhaps some of the leisure time and boredom that they had, we saw an increase in the use of cigarettes, probably through relapse and also recruitment through the use of uh, vape and so forth that I'll talk about in a minute. Over 2,000 adolescents take their first uh, smoke their first cigarette each day. We know that this causes cancer, heart disease, stroke, pulmonary diseases, adverse pregnancy outcomes. It uh, uh, impairs immune function, uh, for instance, uh, flu and um, <clears throat> uh, pneumococcal pneumonia rates are about three times higher in smokers than non-smokers. That's why the pneumococcal vaccine is recommended at age 18 for smokers. And overall, uh, in the general population, it shortens life expectancy by about 10 years. Now, if your patient also has a serious, serious and persistent uh, mental illness, that life expectancy loss is about 20 to 25 years. They suffer disproportionately because they smoke cigarettes harder. They also have a great deal of metabolic disease, um, and that combination um, has a profound effect on their health. Uh, to, smoking adds $300 billion in costs per year, and about a third to half of all tobacco users will die prematurely from tobacco-related diseases. This is someone who's who smoked, uh, uh, you know, for uh, for a number of years, um, but 30 to 50 percent of, of uh, tobacco users will uh, die from tobacco-related diseases. Our 2014 Surgeon General's report is the 50-year report after the initial 1965 report that associated lung cancer um, as being caused by uh, uh, by smoking. Um, and what that report was uh, for a one pack a day smoker um, has a has 11 times the risk for developing lung cancer. A two pack a day smoker, it's more 15 to 20 times the risk of a non-smoker. So about 90% of lung cancers are related to to tobacco. And in this report, they detailed the number of deaths since that initial report. So uh, smoking-related uh, cancer deaths, 6.5 million, cardiovascular and metabolic disease, uh, over uh, uh, 7.8 million pulmonary diseases, uh, conditions related to pregnancy and birth. You can see even residential fires has been quantitated. Uh, smokers fall asleep while they're smoking, and we see increased deaths from houses that then burn and lung cancer is caused by secondhand smoke. It's about 3,000 per year. Um, and coronary artery disease by secondhand smoke. 
it's important that you be sure that your patients, when you're treating them for uh, cardiovascular disease in the hospital, that you ask them about the environment at home and whether they're exposed and if there is a way that you can help them uh, make sure that they are not exposed by perhaps talking to the family or referring family members to a treatment program. Since 1965, we've had about 1,200 people or essentially three 747s loaded with people fully and killing everybody on board every day of the year. So why do we have such a persistent problem when we know about the health benefits? Well, nicotine, uh, I would argue, uh, and many do, that per milligram dose, it's the most addictive substance known to man. Uh, it's, part of, it's an inhaled medication that's absorbed very quickly through uh, the lungs. And the uh, delivery route, the more quickly absorbed, uh, the more addictive a substance is of any kind. Uh, nicotine has many uh, neuropsychological uh, uh, experiences that people have. It acts in the locus ceruleus, which controls arousal, concentration, stress reduction, and appetite. Many people still smoke to control their weight. Uh, when someone quits smoking at about a pack per day, you should expect an eight to 15 pound weight gain on average. Um, and um, uh, you need to be realistic with your patients about who are concerned about that. Uh, in order to counter that, you'd ask them to increase their walking by uh, about 30 minutes a day and reduce their calories by about 200 calories per day. And that should work out to be about the same. Of course, those are also difficult behaviors to control and change. It's a stimulant in the reward pathway, uh, causing dopamine release, uh, which gives a great deal of sense of well being or high, um, and it creates a dependency. And the cycle that smokers are in, um, it, one of the key elements is that uh, tobacco or nicotine has a two hour half life. Uh, it's about 10 seconds to onset for when they get the initial experience of smoking. So, to take you through what happens with a cigarette, if you light a cigarette, it's burning at 625, 650 degrees Fahrenheit. It creates seven to 8,000 chemicals. About 70 of them are known carcinogens that cannot be stored in any uh, a super dump safely or legally in the United States. They include heavy metals, uh, very highly charged uh, ionic particles, uh, nitriles um, uh, that, uh, that are known uh, to create cancer. Um, it is the bulk of those chemicals, a uh, vast majority are TARs, which are hydrocarbons 15 to 25 carbon units long. And that's important because that's a size that fits into the alveoli. It's also what the nicotine adheres to. So the TARs turn out to be the uh, delivery mechanism in which getting the nicotine to the surface of the alveoli, where it's absorbed and shot to the brain with the next beat of the heart. Within 10 seconds, it calms people down, it gets them high, and it helps them concentrate. There's no other drug that provides those three features. And in fact, our initial uh, uh, epidemic of smoking occurred when we put cigarettes in the backpacks of, of uh, World War I soldiers, where they needed all three of those things, a way to feel better, a way to, to have increased concentration. Uh, it helps eye-hand coordination, and it reduces anxiety. Within about two hours, well, as soon as they're exposed to this on a regular basis, and we see tolerance developed with three, four, five cigarettes within the first cigarettes uh, team smoke, uh, but certainly that continues on um, uh, with an upregulation and desensitization of nicotinic receptors, so people have to smoke more to get that same feeling. The average number of cigarettes smoked by whites in the United States is about uh, 21 to 22. Um, black smoke uh, uh, 15 to 16 cigarettes on day because they tend to metabolize nicotine a bit more slowly. Um, the two hour half-life of nicotine and rapid clearance from the brain means that they, once they get to a 50% level of nicotine from the peaks that they've had, they start to experience withdrawal. And many smokers don't know what the syndrome is. It's very, very really important to convey to them 90% uh, of smokers, when they when they don't smoke, get an increase in anxiety. Um, irritability, trouble concentrating, and cravings are all experienced by more than 65 to 70% of smokers. 
And so those are the core symptoms that people get. And those trigger them to return to, to, to smoking. Now, a pack a day smoker inhales <clears throat> 60,000 times over the course of year and gets about a quart of that tar material in their lungs each year. What they're doing is titrating their emotional experience with the mood regulation to feel positive and feel good. And when we ask, and it's become to very integrated with various parts of their life, how they deal with stress, go through work, um, uh, whether they smoke after meals, becomes associated with patterns in their life and highly um, uh, reinforced. And to ask someone to quit smoking is going to have to be sort of, it's sort of an individual pathway that, that has been developed in their life because of these associations. And they're gonna to have to figure out how to not smoke and feel positively about what they're doing um, in their life to regulate their own emotions and experience those. Some, some adults uh, who smoked uh, heavily uh, from the time they're teenagers never really have experienced how they regulate themselves without nicotine in their lives. And so we need to follow through with them about that, let them know something about what's happening and how they can help manage that. <clears throat> this is uh, a graph. So the, the first one is a cigarette. It's uh, uh, You see that when the person does not smoke overnight, they get very low levels of nicotine. So that first cigarette in the morning turns out to be um, one that's most gratifying and perhaps most uh, uh, important. They smoke it harder. They generally get more than a milligram of nicotine out of that cigarette. And the average for the rest of the day is about a milligram. And they get a very rapid rise in their nicotine level. Um, and by about two hours, uh, uh, that starts to hit the 50% mark and they start to experience withdrawal. Now, if you look at the, the red line here, um, uh, this is the patch, which has a very slow uptake and it's not addictive, but many smokers feel that it is addictive. You can assure them that it's not. They can stay on the patch probably on the same dose through six to 12 weeks um, and just simply stop it without fear of withdrawal. Um, and it will reduce those withdrawal symptoms. Um, the gum and the nasal spray are uh, absorbed slightly more rapidly, but again, the same features as trying to keep them above a level at which they experience uh, withdrawal. This peak here is where the pleasure from smoking comes from. And the added benefit that varenicline has is it blocks, it's a nicotine antagonist on the uh, acetylcholine nicotinic subtype receptor in the ventral tegmental area. It has a 24 hour half-life and it adheres to that receptor 25,000 times more strongly than nicotine does. So it has a blocking mechanism but at the same time, it also works over here to prevent withdrawal symptoms. So you get actually two mechanisms that are working with the Chantix and why, I think, part of why uh, it's a superior drug. Uh, patients will notice this. About 65% of patients, when they start on varenicline within two or three days, uh, will no longer like the taste of the cigarette and be able to cut down either by smoking less on that cigarette or smoking fewer cigarettes. You want to encourage them to do that if they're using that medication. They started a, uh, essentially a week before intended quit uh, or uh, as a process for trying to cut down and eventually quit. Again, the withdrawal syndrome uh, that I think is very important for people to understand, anxiety, intense cravings for nicotine, tension, irritability, restlessness, and headaches. Ask them if they have these when they don't smoke. They can actually test them out to find out whether they get them. Um, we also have a great deal of information about effects now of, well, uh, short-term effects of e-cigarettes, um, uh, which are not combusted tobacco, but they are nicotine that's delivered with hydrocarbons uh, that are heated, and that's how they get into the lungs. So it's still a very rapid absorption, and people remain dependent on nicotine while they use these products as long as there's nicotine in them. Um, we've started to aggregate effects for them, and a nice review published in circulation identifies uh, increase in heart rate and blood pressure, as you might expect. In one cross-sectional study, about a 70% increase in uh, myocardial infarction, increased sympathetic tone, and increased oxidative stress. 
uh, vascular stiffening, endothelial dysfunction, platelet ag aggregation, and oxidative stress in the vascular effects, and risk of asthma, bronchitis, oxidative stress, and the uh, e-cigarette vaping product associated uh, lung injury, uh, which can be fatal. We've had probably had over 100 cases that have been reported in the literature of that. Most of those came from uh, people who were adding THC into their vape product, but they did happen in patients with, uh, in people just using the nicotine. Um, essentially, if someone continues to vape um, rather than quit smoking, uh, they really don't get benefits uh, in the pulmonary area. And there may not be, there may be long-term cardiac benefits uh, that people are exposed to. So some of the problems with e-cigarettes and, and the UK uh, literature uh, and public health uh, takes a different perspective on, on e-cigarettes. They recommend them for quitting smoking uh, because of the decreased uh, exposure to the products of, com of combustion. And the US uh, Preventive Services Task Force has not endorsed them and recommended instead use of the traditional products. Um, in 2019, over 27% of, uh, of high school students reported using uh, vapor e-cigarettes in the last 30 days, and 10% of uh, junior high students. Uh, a meta-analysis of longitudinal studies uh, uh, showed that once a, a student or child begins using uh, a vape or e-cigarette, there's a three times uh, higher rate at which they convert to full tobacco use. And tobacco is generally a better high, and if they experiment with both, they'll end up as a dual user or switch over to, uh, to tobacco, um, which gets them helps recruit them for long-term use for the tobacco uh, industry to sell their products to. Um, One-year abstinence rates of 18% uh, with use of e-cigarettes is cited by the uh, UK literature and public health area versus 9.9% uh, for e-cigarettes versus NRT. But it's it's one study. Um, it uh, was not followed over a long period of time. And what was found with follow-up um, over time was that if people quit using the e-cigarette, 80% of them were still using it after one year, whereas with nicotine replacement, it's only 9%. So they're continuing to get that uh, stress on their cardiovascular system and their lungs. Um, and that's that's part of why the U.S. system does not endorse that. In addition, about 25% of cigarette users become dual users, um, and that as as harmful or perhaps more harmful than uh, just smoking alone. There's also data on uh, perioperative benefits of smoking cessation, and this is described in a few ways. Um, uh, wound healing complications are more than doubled in smoke in smokers versus non-smokers, and this is in very large cohorts of, of individuals. Pulmonary complications, about 70% increase. Um, a myocardial infarction is increased. And interestingly enough, when they followed people and just identified whether they smoked on the day of the operation or not, um, if they did smoke, they had an almost a doubling of uh, wound site infections. Um, and that has led recommendations to be, if you have a patient that is headed for an operation, you want to advise them to quit. The, the optimal level for improvement is, that we target is about four weeks, but even not smoking for the week or the day before the operation seems to be beneficial. Um, now, if you look at intervention studies that have provided smoking cessation counseling versus no treatment uh, for people in the preoperative state, we see a, a reduction of any complications by almost 60%, and wound healing-related complications are decreased almost 70%. Uh, again, that's uh, 13 trials, um, and a couple thousand patients are involved in those studies. Um, intensive treatment, counseling plus medications, has one advantage over even brief treatment or your brief advice uh, in that it translates well into long-term cessation. So if the person is willing to go for intensive treatment, they are more likely to not be smoking at the time of the operation, but they'll also not 
uh, be more likely, significantly more likely to not be smoking at six months and a year after that. Um, and if you compare intensive counseling versus brief counseling on wound healing, we can again see an improvement in uh, wound healing uh, for those receiving the intensive treatment. So we are in the process of establishing a pathway for uh, working with uh, patients in uh, the vascular surgery program. There's probably about 400 a year that are waiting for elective surgery that we have a kind of time frame where we can provide an intensive intervention, four to eight visits, medications and behavioral counseling. We'll see them, some of these patients I see even once a week if they really need, if they're uh, high level smoking or they're very anxious about quitting but every two to three weeks until they're tobacco free for four weeks is the goal. Um, one of the important motivation messages about helping people quit smoking is uh, to talk about the benefits of cessation as opposed to trying to scare them. Remember, anxiety is a major reason why people smoke and uh, it's helpful to not tweak their anxiety by talking about all the horrible ways that they may die. But we have lots of positive messages that you can give here. So um, after 12 hours, carbon monoxide levels return to normal. Two weeks to three months, lung function uh, improves and then stabilizes. It becomes that of, of a non, uh, the rate of decline becomes that of a non-smoker after that period of time. After about four weeks, the risk for perioperative complications falls. Um, after one to two years, heart, heart attack and stroke risk is half. So there's a very rapid decline in risk for cardiovascular events when quitting smoking, um, and then a slower decline over the long term uh, after that. Uh, cancers generally take five to 10 years for their uh, risk to fall in half. So the immediate benefit of cardiovascular uh, benefit is one of, the reasons, one of the things I emphasize when I talk with patients about quitting. They are particularly sensitive uh, and interested to hear that stroke risk is going to fall. And anyone, uh, at any one time, if you take a cross-section sample, 70% uh, of smokers have made uh, at least one unsuccessful uh, quit attempt. Uh, over 55% tried uh, will try to quit each year. Only about 7% of those that try will succeed. Um, but patients, that, more than that, they come to us. They're in our clinics uh, because they're sicker. They have more health issues, and we have a chance to intervene with them. Take the time to give them at least brief advice um, if you can. Um, that's going to increase their chance for quitting, even if they don't do it right there. It sets a tone. And smokers tend to feel a tacit approval for smoking if it's not brought up at a healthcare visit. So brief counseling and medications can double the quit rates and intensive treatments can up to quadruple them. A large study um, that was a comparative effectiveness study across the patch, bupropion and varenicline compar and compared to placebo, 8,000 patients studied half were with uh, mental illness and half without mental illness. This identified ver varenicline as uh, uh, significantly more effective than the patch and bupropion and patch and bupropion were significantly better than placebo. The study, however, was done to look for neuro, a severe neuro uh, psychiatric uh, events. So that's agitation, um, depression, suicidality, hostility, as all one composite endpoint, because there was concern that that might increase with the use of varenicline and Wellbutrin. So there were black box warnings. And this study demonstrated that there, in fact, was no increase. In fact, in the, in the non-mentally ill population, there was a significant decrease in, in neuro, severe neuropsychiatric events uh, when using varenicline. The others were about equivalent. So in that population, it's about 2% uh, of individuals, even placebo and with uh, treatment, uh, get this. In the severe uh, mental health areas, there's no difference between the, any of the medications and placebo, and it's occurring at about 5 to 6% of the population. Um, I'm going to take some time now and briefly describe uh, self-determination theory. Uh, it's a general theory of human motivation, um, and it's it's a different type of theory than uh, behavioral theories and most health-related uh, theories that are uh, being employed or used uh, to aid people in uh, making changes, uh, positive changes in their life. Now, motivation is a really common term 
And if you're going to use it scientifically, you have to have a specific definition for it, a way to measure it, a way to show that you can change it. Um, within self-determination theory, we define uh, motivation as human energy that's directed toward a particular goal. In medicine, we're great at identifying goals. What I think we can probably do better at is discerning what type of energy, the quality of motivation that's moving them toward that goal um, and trying in by paying attention to psychological needs that they have while we deliver our intervention. And I'll go over those in a second. Um, Self-determination theory is always tested in a free choice paradigm, which is equivalent to what we're doing in clinical practice. So it has some relevance how these studies are done for what we do because patients don't have to do what we say. Also in the studies, interventions end usually for six months. So we can test to see whether the person is autonomous in maintaining the health behavior change. So our follow-ups are long-term. And if they've, if they've taken it on for themselves, that's a process called internalization. And it's a very different process than reinforcement uh, and uh, behavioral change. Um, another difference in this is that self-determination theory assumes that humans are innately motivated toward well-being and personal growth. And I will argue that you're going to act differently with a patient if you feel you are the one needing to motivate them versus if you feel you're working with them to identify motivation within them and to support them in, uh, in achieving what they're trying to do. <clears throat> it uh, it uh, posits uh, that there are three psychological needs that we all have in, in all circumstances. And if these needs are not supported, things go wrong. If they are supported, people generate long-term positive motivation with improved well-being. These needs are for autonomy. That is the need to feel choiceful and volitional in one's behavior, competence, the need to feel optimally challenged and capable of achieving outcomes, and relatedness. That's the need to feel connected and understood by important others. To the extent that we do this in our treatments, patients will get more motivated and be more likely to internalize the message we have and be able to turn that into a positive quality of energy that they have that helps them sustain long-term quit rates. So internalization is an inherent proactive process by the self in which autonomous and competence motivations are increased naturally over time in positive environments that support those. Now, this maps very well on to medical professional and biomedical ethics, which in the year 2000 added two outcomes to the equivalence uh, importance, primary outcome of in the primacy of patient welfare, which has always been what we have focused on in, in those traditions, which is a dedication to serving patients' interest. But equivalent to that, if you don't improve someone's welfare, but you increase their autonomy, um, you have a successful outcome because patients do not have to take what we recommend as our treatments. The idea here is to empower patients to make informed decisions. And there is both a positive obligation and a negative obligation according to biomedical ethics that's very relevant to motivation theory. Positive obligation is to inform patients of risks and treatments that may be beneficial to them. To be silent about that is, is undermining their autonomy because people have to have knowledge. Knowledge is necessary but not sufficient for motivation. Um, it's, we also have an obligation not to be controlling or coercive of our patients. And that uh, also fits into motivation theory. If we are overbearing, people can uh, become feel guilty. They, they have a poor quality of motivation or become dissociated. Um, and they, they fail to internalize uh, the, in the positive way. Um, and they're not as able to sustain uh, their changes that they're trying. Social justice was the third need for uh, to eliminate discrimination. And I, I won't go much into that, but they actually that would relate to some of the needs as well. So in the studies, we first had to develop measures for autonomy and autonomy supportiveness, competence supportiveness and relatedness supportiveness. So the early part of my career was doing that. Uh, to support autonomy, we trained our clinicians uh, uh, to elicit and acknowledge patients' perspectives and feelings. That's in that first A in the model to explore their values and how they relate to the behavior being addressed. What would it be like for them to not be a smoker? What would it be like if they continued to smoke? Um, 
provide a clear rationale for advice given. This, this maps on to that positive obligation we have in ethics. If you don't provide the clear advice with the information behind it, they can't begin to internalize and take over autonomous motivation. Uh, provide effective options for change and acknowledge the option of not changing. Most Americans are not changing their health behaviors. That's the state of where we are. Um, it, I think we need to acknowledge that while we make a recommendation for change and say that we are ready, ready to support them in being able to do that. Look for self-initiation change. Look for any small change that the patients make, made in the past or when they come back. That's evidence that they've been trying. That's evidence that they're going to be for, likely be able to get further with the next attempt with appropriate support as they go forward. And it's important for patients to hear that we value, even if they've stopped smoking for a couple of days or they've made a, a different behavior change, uh, they've tried it out, they're learning more about how this would happen. Minimize pressure and control. For competence support, be positive the patient can succeed. Also very important for people to understand that you feel they can be successful. To provide accurate evidence, effective uh, effectance relevant feedback about how they can be more successful, identify barriers to change, teach them about withdrawal, about skills building, about how to change their behaviors and problem solving, and develop a plan that's appropriate to their abilities. If you give them something that's too hard, they become overwhelmed and helpless. If it's too easy, they get bored. You look for that sweet spot for the next step that they want to take forward and challenge themselves with, and only the patient really knows that. So ask them, is what would be challenging to you? Would that be not smoking for a week, for a day? Would it be for a month? Let's build toward that as you, on your way to your long-term cessation. You're going to learn much more about that. When they fail, and they will, most people do, reframe that as a short success. Uh, develop empathy, positive relationship, and remain not judgmental. Now, Across the studies and the interventions that we've done in healthcare, we have found that randomized controlled studies, and there's a meta-analysis, several meta-analysis, but one with 63 studies, um, identify that when people are randomized to a care environment that has trained them to support these needs uh, in conjunction with the treatments that they are receiving, that increases autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And that change in autonomy, competence, and relatedness is associated with each of these positive outcomes. If it has an asterisk next to it, that's a randomized controlled trial with the mediation demonstration that the benefit improved through these psychological needs. So that's increase in vitality, decrease in depression, somatization, anxiety, improvement in quality of life. There's associations with decrease with su suicidality, but that's not been shown in a randomized intervention. Not smoking, improved cholesterol, specifically LDL cholesterol, uh, physical activity, weight loss, diabetes control, medication use, healthier diet, dental health, and reduced alcohol all have uh, consistent effects. And so this is arguably a general uh, model of motivation that you can apply across certainly cardiovascular benefits, but also many parts of healthcare that affect people's length and quality of life. This is a meta-analysis uh, published in Health Psychology um, by the authors are all outside of self-determination theory, and they do a process called a causal meta-analysis, which is kind of an interesting process. Identified 67 randomized studies, 135 effects, and they found a moderate uh, uh, change in health, health behaviors when autonomy uh, increased. And the same, and a slightly smaller effect when perceived competence was increased. And, but interestingly enough, only about 35, 40% of the interventions actually changed autonomy or competence. And the causal level of this, they contrast those, those studies that did not or did achieve the change in autonomous and motivation and look for a change in health behavior. And they found that there was a significant improvement if that motivation actually changed. So that's the the next level of causation that they add to this. And they conclude that autonomy and competence are uh, viable clinical targets uh, for assisting people in changing health behaviors. I'm gonna to try to start to summarize now a little bit at the five uh, take home points, the five A's again, assess, advise, agree, assist and arrange. Um, a little bit more detail and assess. I ask people what they like about smoking, it's important. That's what they're gonna miss, but it's also 
uh, acknowledging to them that there is something positive that they're going to have to give up. Identifying their level of addiction is how many cigarettes they smoke and the time to the first cigarette. If it's within five minutes, they're highly addicted. If it's uh, within 30 minutes, they're still strongly addicted, but not quite as so much. Um, and it, over 15 cigarettes a day is considered uh, to be strongly addicted. Um, how many caffeinated drinks do they have each day? I identify that because caffeine and nicotine are metabolized by the same enzyme in the liver. Caffeine has about a six hour half-life. I've had patients drinking up to 80 cups of coffee. Um, and if they stop smoking, they suddenly, they get gradually over the ensuing few days of quitting smoking, they get toxic on their caffeine if they don't reduce that. So I ask them, anybody drinking more than three caffeinated beverages a day to cut their caffeine in half around the time so it doesn't get confused with the withdrawal effects and the treatments you need to provide there. Look for alcohol or, or various drinks or uh, behaviors that are associated with the smoking and ask them if they're willing to leave those behind at least for a dur duration of time while they, while they quit. Um, assist in their uh, quit attempt, be positive they can succeed. We talked about that before. You want to emphasize staying on varenicline or bupropion uh, or the patch for long enough. Typically smokers are trying to stop this within weeks or days, but the most effective treatments go out for three to six months with these medications. And that covers withdrawal over the two to three month period of time. Um, make sure that they understand uh, that varenicline uh, gives them their best advantage. Only about 7% have to stop that for side effects. Uh, and about 95% of people can use the patch, uh, about 90% uh, with bupropion. Uh, but be sure that they understand the length of time that they need to use. Now, when you're structuring a habit change, um, I have them, and to reduce their addiction, I have them cut down steadily to five to 10 cigarettes within the week as they start the Chantix or Bupropion or get to their quit date. Tapering below that doesn't seem to help because they get gaps in their nicotine coverage and they're sort of in purgatory going back and forth between that. But you can cut a third of your cigarettes out or puffs on a cigarette within a week and not experience withdrawal. Delay their first cigarette to greater than 30 minutes after waking and after meals. Change brands to one they don't like. Don't buy any more tobacco or nicotine or, uh, cigarettes that they, that they like. Change their brand. Change their pattern of smoking. Don't smoke in the same places. Um, ask others to support them. Have them hold the cigarette in, a, in their opposite hand and in different fingers in their hand. That will really feel odd. If it feels odd, that's how they know they're changing the habit. And they have about two or three weeks before that becomes a new habit. They can use taste distractions such as citrus fruits, cinnamon sticks, frozen grapes, put them in their mouth, keep them there for three or four minutes. Most cravings only last one to two minutes. That can help them be distract, uh, distract, remain distracted. I'll finish up with saying that in terms of the behaviors uh, integrated with your healthcare treatment, elicit perspectives, acknowledge affect, provide effective options for change, clear advice when we have clear evidence that's and there's an improved outcome, support initiations for change, minimize control, skills problem build and problem solve, and provide a positive relationship that they can come back to. In this way, you're maybe more likely to motivate change, improve health and quality of life. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer some questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Williams. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm gonna start off and I have some of the questions here um, as well. I'm gonna start off with a question. Um, you know, you showed a lot of uh, data about um, how medical therapy, uh, behavioral therapy affect and can help patients quit smoking. What I was surprised was in um, the clinical trials that you showed the, um, percentage of patients who were able to quit smoking was pretty low. At least I, I, the numbers were, were strikingly low to me. I think that the highest number was 27%, and most of the, the, the studies showed um, less than 20% effectiveness in, in, in quitting smoking. What, what are we missing in terms of having that uh, success, uh, success um, rate of, of quitting smoking to be 
eighty percent, ninety percent, or something like that? Or is that something that it's unlikely to be achieved in the future? Uh, well, it sure would be uh, would be great if it did. Um, the I think that the gold standard uh, that the tobacco expert uh, treatment experts in the world uh, would say that if you have something that's above 40% quit rate at one year, and remember these are long-term follow-ups, they're not just for the days or weeks that this is going on. They have to maintain cessation and have biochemical validated uh, not having nicotine or carbon monoxide in their system uh, weekly for uh, usually it's uh, six to eight weeks consecutively in order to be considered quit. So that's involved with that outcome and that's hard to achieve. Um, I think anything above 40% would be considered a, a gold standard or 40, even 40% in the tobacco cessation centers. Uh, motivation plays a great deal with, uh, into that. If some, the person wants to quit, they're more likely to quit. And the best study I've seen is a phase three study with varenicline done in Europe to demonstrate the maintenance of cessation provided benefit. And they had 1,900 patients who were came in weekly for five A's counseling and uh, varenicline or placebo. And uh, three first three months were open label and then they went to randomized placebo versus continued varenicline. And with that highly motivated population, there was a 70% quit rate at the time that they got to the, after three months. Immediately within two weeks, there was a 20% decline in the placebo group. And that, that remained significantly lower um, throughout the balance of the year. How are we gonna do that? We're gonna, uh, I think it would be great if we could get to those levels. It, it doesn't really acknowledge the chronic relapsing nature of, of addiction and how people have to work through that and the motivational resources that they need. I think we need to build a system that engages with them, makes it positive for them to come in for treatment and, and provide treatments at uh, reduced costs. That's how we're going to improve those quit rates. Um, uh, and that's active area of research. Um, I have a question from the audience. Ronald Schwartz says, very helpful talk, Joff. Thank you. Two questions. Are non-smokers who grew up in home with both parents smoking at increased risk of cancer or cardiovascular disease? And two, any benefit of semaglutide to overcome tobacco sensation? Uh, I'll answer the the second one. I'm I'm not aware, but um, you know, there's a, a variety of medications which, uh, once people are on, we can see changes in uh, gratification of smoking. I know that there is change of perception of alcohol use with uh, 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 with the uh, GLP one uh, medications. Um, I have not heard of that about tobacco dependence, but it wouldn't surprise me if they may find some associations. Uh, metformin was another one that they that they found that there was some differences with um, as well. Um, now, the first part of the question is someone exposed to consistent cigarette smoke. Yes, I think that they would, particularly children, their lungs in their maturation period are particularly sensitive to cancer risk over time. Um, the... Uh, the more the cigarette smoke and persistently that they're exposed to that impairs the full maturation of their lungs and leaves them at risk going forward. I'm not as sure about heart disease, but if it's a consistent pattern where they're exposed to endothelial uh, dysfunction, uh, uh, promotion, even HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol becomes more, uh, LDL cholesterol becomes oxidized and uh, more atherogenic. Uh, there may be differences in that going forward. It certainly is not going to be positive in that effect on cardiovascular outcomes. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. We really enjoy your, your presentation. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm.